Okay, I think we'll, we'll start. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, this is the uh, third Stress at Work seminar, and uh, today we'll be talking about quantum of damages in the Employment Tribunal and Civil Courts. This webinar is being recorded. It will be shared afterwards, uh, as will the slides that you'll see. If anyone has any questions, please put your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat, and we will endeavour to answer them. We are uh, hoping to finish in around an hour and leave plenty of time for questions at the end. As I say, this is the third seminar. The first two seminars um, are also available on our website. The first looked at the general principles and key differences between bringing a tribunal claim and bringing a county court claim. And the second looked at concurrent claims. And a standout point for me in that second talk was uh, how abuse of process works, and particularly if a process, if a party could and should have raised an issue earlier in proceedings. Uh, the Henderson and Henderson rule. It shows, um, I think, the importance that if you're a predominantly an employment tribunal practitioner, uh, that you are aware of the claims uh, in the court and uh, vice versa, so that you bring the right claim at the right place on the right issues. So turning to uh, today, um, you'll see there is only three of us. Uh, unfortunately, Adiolia uh, won't be joining us today. Um, she's asked us to share uh, that she has uh, suffered a bereavement within the family and is uh, very sorry that she can't be with us. And therefore, those that were expecting uh, to hear from her, including um, topics such as pension loss and tips on uh, schedule of loss, I'm afraid uh, we won't be having that today. We decided not to postpone because uh, we postponed for similar reasons uh, last time round. So we, we thought it, uh, that we should get this done uh, today. Um, but we send our condolences uh, to uh, Adiola and her family. You'll first be hearing from Christopher Johnson and uh, Rachel Woodward. They'll be covering uh, an overview of quantum and stress of work claims in the county court including general and special damages, uh, as well as considering some key topical issues which arise when quantifying those claims. Um, so I'll now hand over to Rachel. Thank you, Muktiar, um, and hello, everyone. I'm afraid I've slightly lost my voice today, so you might have to turn your volumes up in order to be able to hear me but uh, hopefully you will be able to. And if anyone is struggling, please put something in the, in the Q&A and I can try and rectify that. Uh, as Nuktiar said, um, both Chris and I will be speaking about quantum in the civil courts today. And unfortunately you won't have Adiola's perspective who was going to look at this uh, in the employment arena. Um, although we will of course do our best to answer any questions that come up around that. And hopefully some of the issues that I discussed today will help you in drafting schedules of loss, which was one of, going to be one of the topics that Adiola was talking about. Uh, turning then to quantum in the civil courts for stress at work claims. Um, and this is, of course, a very broad topic to try and cover in the short time I have today. And I focused on some particular aspects of quantum that are likely to arise in stress at work claims although this is by no means a comprehensive summary of those issues and there will be time for questions at the end if anyone thinks I've missed anything particularly important and you can see the topics on the screen that I will be going through. Turning then to the first one and that is general damages and PSLA and this is undoubtedly the aspect of general damages that practitioners will be the most familiar with. And I wanted to say a few short words about this before moving into discussing how to quantify PSLA. And that is that it can be very easy to focus on this in a very overly medical context. And whilst it is, of course, important to be looking at the diagnosis that your claimant has and what their prognosis would be um, with treatment, 
it's important to remember the holistic picture and consider how the injury has impacted aspects of someone's everyday life. So in essence, don't forget the loss of amenity aspect of uh, PSLA. Into how uh, PSLA is calculated, uh, this talk helpfully, or perhaps not so helpfully, coincides with perhaps the most exciting developments that can happen in the PSLA world, and that is the publication of the new JC guidelines. So the 17th edition is officially published on Friday, the 5th of April. Um, unfortunately, my copy of that version hasn't yet arrived, so I haven't had a chance to look at it myself. But I've scoured commentary online for those lucky enough to have received it regarding the updates um, on the 16th edition. It seems that a key update will be in relation to inflation, and I know that Chris will be talking more about that later, so I won't say anything more on that. Um, I've also flagged on this slide, we'll mainly be considering today, obviously, psychiatric and psychological damage as a re result of stress at work, and that in some circumstances may include damages for sexual and or physical abuse, and this section has apparently been significantly updated in the 17th edition, although, as I say, I haven't had a chance to look at it myself. That's all to say that you have to take my next few slides with a pinch of salt, I'm afraid, and in the knowledge that they will very quickly become outdated, but the underlying principles will hopefully remain the same. Looking then at chapter four of the guidelines, I uh, just wanted to flag that you'll mainly be dealing with section A, psychiatric damage generally, and section B, PTSD. And it's important to remember um, when you need to use each section. Section B is when PTSD is the sole psychiatric condition that's been diagnosed, whereas section A is suitable for when you have psychiatric conditions that are not PTSD, or importantly, when you have PTSD and other psychiatric conditions. And in those latter circumstances, the PTSD will move the awards to the upper end of any bracket. So if you're dealing with anything uh, other than PTSD, you need to not be looking in section B and you need to instead be focusing on section A and remembering what PTSD will do to your calculation. The guidelines very helpfully take into and set out key factors to be taken into account when valuing stress at work claims. And it's important to go back to what I was saying earlier and look at what life is like as a whole for a claimant now. The checklist is in fact very broad. You can see, for example, the effect on the injured person's relationships with those who may come into contact. So please don't in any way feel restrained by these factors when, when you're considering making submissions or drafting schedules of loss based on the guidelines. And think about all the aspects of a claimant's life, what was important to them prior to their injury and how this has changed following the injury. I'm going to go through these next slides very quickly, as you will, of course, need to make reference to the new guidelines and the figures on the slides and in the new edition and not updating for current inflation as of mid-March 2024. Um, but I just wanted to point out that in categories B, for moderately severe psychiatric injury, and um, in category C, for moderate psychiatric injury, there is specific reference to work-related stress and the difference between the two um, being how long the symptoms have lasted. That doesn't mean in other cases of work-related stress that you can't go up into category A or down into category D, um, but B and C can be a useful anchor point when you're considering uh, where your claim will fall. Of course, the JC guidelines are just one aspect of quantifying PSLA, and the key point here is also to always check your quantum reports, but don't feel restrained by them. And importantly, don't presume you've found a winning case if you find one that's particularly high or especially low, because it's often these kinds of cases um, that are reported. Uh, Cross-reference back to the JC guidelines and, and make sure your case is sense checked. And I've put some key factors on the slide there. Um, these are the things you need to be checking. And if you find a case that you think will help you, um, look at your case against that case and are, are those key factors the same because they will be the main things that will determine at the level of your award. And remember, of course, that the nature of the exercise is inherently fact specific and you need to take account of any changes in factual circumstance. That's a very quick uh, tour through PSLA. And then moving on to the second aspect of general damages uh, that I wanted to cover this evening, and that is loss of congenial employment. 
And importantly, this is separate to a claim in special damages for loss of earnings. And it's found when there is a particular disappointment um, for someone who's unable to pursue a career that they thought they would have enjoyed or that they were enjoying at the time of injury. And Chris will be speaking more about the cases in which this is appropriate to plead. Um, so I'm going to focus uh, for now on how to quantify it. It's important to take into account the following factors that are on, on the screen, and you can have a look at those uh, in more detail in your own time. Uh, you'll see I've put the case of Morrow and Shrewsbury Rugby Union Football Club up there. Um, it's quite a useful reminder to us all. In that case, the claimant was injured when he was struck on the head by a collapsing rugby goalpost, um, and he was unable to continue his work as an IFA. Mrs Justice Fairby in that case found that the claimant had failed to prove that he enjoyed the work and that in fact the evidence showed that he found the work of an IFA tiring and stressful and in short terms he struggled with it and therefore no award was granted. Uh, query given that these awards are often found in vocational uh, employment, normally for emergency service workers um, or nurses, doctors, whether you could say that any of those jobs couldn't be properly categorised as tiring and stressful. Uh, but it's important to remember when you're looking at your witness evidence what you want to be bringing out from the claimant and it really is a focus on them enjoying aspects of their work. In terms of valuing the ward, the courts have repeatedly said that it's important that things are kept in proportion and again remember that this is not in any way linked to earnings. The awards are often between five and ten thousand pounds although sometimes they can go outside of this i put the case of Appleton on the slides, which is a useful one uh, to go away and have a look at. This was a professional footballer for West Bromwich Albion. And as a consequence of negligence, he had to give up playing professional football. What's interesting in this case is that the claimant was still involved in football in a non-professional capacity. So it's helpful if you have a claimant where their work uh, overlaps with their hobby, for example, a footballer um, or perhaps a gardener, something like that and the claimant is still able to be involved in that work in a non-professional capacity, that won't necessarily stop you from getting a loss of congenial employment award. And in Appleton, the judge said that the claimant was coming to the peak of his playing years as a professional footballer in a career that was many a schoolboy's dream. And there, the exceptional case justified an exceptional award of £25,000. Um, unfortunately, though, that's often not the case, and generally awards are uh, under £10,000. And I've set out um, some recent examples uh, of awards on the screen there that it's useful to go away and have a look at. And of course, there will necessarily need to be a much higher reliance on case law for this head of loss than for PSLA, given the lack of other guidelines. So it's useful to really have a look around and see if there's anything that matches your claim. Turning then to special damages, and of course, there's a multitude of heads of loss that may factor into stress at work claims. And it's important that careful consideration is given to what is appropriate in the claim that you're specifically dealing with. However, I thought that these three, so loss of earnings and pension, care and assistance and medical treatment might be especially useful to discuss. Starting with loss of earnings, there is of course a different approach to past and future losses. Um, and for past losses, you're essentially looking at your net earning capacity for your claimant over the period prior to trial and deducting the actual earnings of the claimant. Perhaps easier said than done in some circumstances, and you still need to consider promotions and career opportunities that would have been available to the claimant, especially as cases take ever longer to get to trial or settlement. You might be dealing with a significant period for past losses. I'm not going to spend too much time on that though, uh, and turning to future losses, there are various routes that you can take in quantifying and pleading future loss of earnings. Um, essentially though, you're looking at what the claimant is likely to earn in the future compared with what they would have earned but for the injury. The first and perhaps conventional way of calculating this is through the multiplier multiple hand approach. Um, and you first need to look at what your claimant could have earned and then is earning, that's your multiple can figure. Um, and you're looking at their but for earnings, residual earnings on the balance of probabilities. And that's taking into all the factors on the screen, including future promotions, pay rises, whether they would have changed jobs um, over time, everything. Um, and then you need to look at how you can't 
calculate this over the course of their working life. And unfortunately, I think we could take a full hour and a half discussing the best way to calculate multipliers and loss of earning claims. Um, and I think I can't say anything more helpful than it's really important to go away and look at the Ogden tables and the associated commentary within those tables and within facts and figures. And there's really no replacement um, for looking at that and getting your head around them. Uh, however, a couple of words of warning when you're looking at those tables three to eight, which deal with loss of earnings, are subject to adjustments for contingencies other than mortality. Um, so you cannot take them as read, you need to consider other contingencies. But table A4 in the Ogden tables incorporates those factors without the need for further calculation. And the contingencies are as set out on the slide there, so employment status, educational attainment and disability status. Very brief word about employment status, think about the reality of your claimant's employment. So if you have someone who has technically remained on the books of um, a defendant following a stress at work injury, but they haven't actually been able to work since then, um, you can class them as non-employed um, for the purposes of the calculation and you just need to be uh, ready to explain why in your schedule of loss. Often the educational attainment, so for someone um, pre and post injury will remain the same, but the starkest of examples will come from people who are in the process of attaining higher qualifications at the time of injury and who will no longer be able to achieve this. And it's always something worth checking with your claimant. And then I've set up the test for disability status at the bottom of um, the slide there. It's important to note in relation to the second part of the test, the specific reference to the 1995 Disability Discrimination Act. And section B of the Ogden notes give examples of the ways in which a disability may affect one's day-to-day -day activity. That's the second part of the test, as you'll see. And on the interpretation of normal and substantial, and there's very useful examples given there as to what um, contributes or what can be classified as affecting someone's normal day-to-day -day activities in a substantial way. And it's really important to remember that this is not the definition found in the Equality Act. So it's a different test that you're looking at um, when you're considering these contingencies. So that's the conventional approach of the multiplier multiplicand. Uh, there's also a uh, possibility of a Smith and Manchester award after the case of the same name. These are separate lump sum awards and they are technically general damages. And they should be pleaded in particulars of injury. It's important to remember that. And um, I thought it made perhaps more sense to talk about them now rather than the general damages uh, section of this talk. Essentially, it looks at the claimant's position in the open labour market. Um, and there's a helpful quote on, on the screen there. You can see the second part of it, which sets out um, the purpose of a Smith and Manchester award. And it can be used, for example, where after sustaining an injury, a claimant may return to their former work at the same pay or similar work with the same or better salary. But as a result of long term effects of the injury, there may be circumstances where they may in the future be worse off, um, for example, if they lose their job um, and will be at disadvantage for getting new work. The risk they will be in that situation so that they may be put at a disadvantage on the labour market needs to be real or substantial. Um, that doesn't mean that it needs to be likely. So the risk can be unlikely, but still real. Um, and the risk can also come from the claimant deciding to leave their current employment themselves. So it doesn't necessarily have to come from there being a risk that they'll be made redundant or that they'll be dismissed. Um, the valuation of Smith and Manchester awards, I often see this quote um, from a very old case, but saying that it's nothing more than a guess. And I think that's probably quite accurate, although it can of course be a calculated guess based on the claimant's net earnings, it's generally between three months and five years. The courts won't consider anything under three months and um, being worth making the award. Um, and it's very, very rare for anything to be above five years. And commonly the awards would be, to be between six months and two years net earnings. And there's various factors um, that will go into the calculation of the Smith and Manchester award and they're on the screen. And it's also worth looking at Chamberlain's, uh, Justice Chamberlain's judgment in BXB, a relatively recent case, 
which approves some uh, dicta in relation to how you calculate the, these awards and what needs to be taken into account. Um, as with all of these things, evaluation is uh, highly fact specific um, and needs to be thought about carefully. The other option for future loss of earnings um, is, of course, a, a Blamire Award. Um, it's often spoke about in conjunction with Smith and Manchester Awards, uh, or referred to as a separate lump sum award. Can be used with Smith and Manchester Awards, but it's distinct and it should be used when there are too many uncertainties to adopt the conventional multiplier multiple account approach. And the courts have been very clear about the circumstances uh, when this award should be used. And that's that it shouldn't be used unless there is no real alternative. Um, I've put a few examples of cases where it can arise, but I suppose the takeaway message here is if you're in a situation where you think that there might be too many uncertainties in your case to come up with your multiple account, um, perhaps because your claim in, uh, was only very recently in work prior to the injury, or there's uncertainty about their future, whether they would continue the full-time work, or perhaps take in parental leave, um, that's not necessarily the end of the road, and you can look at the lump sum awards uh, and the various cases that I've put up there. In order to value these awards, um, it's best to start with your multiplier, multiple account approach. So make the calculation as if the courts were going to award that and then consider allowances for the uncertainties. Uh, unfortunately, it still seems to be um, quite unpredictable as to what discount judges will make um, in various cases. And I've put a few examples up there. Um, the Van Wees case from 2007 is a really good one to have a look at because the judge goes through quite a detailed explanation of, of how um, he's come to a relatively high award and you can always borrow um, aspects of that. Um, but essentially the courts tend to take the kind of pleaded multiplier, multiple account approach and then apply your discount to that. Um, as well as loss of earnings, I think we could again have a, a full seminar on loss of pension. Um, and I'm afraid I'm going to say very little about that tonight. But in principle, you use the same conventional approach um, for loss of earnings. So you're looking at what your claimant's pension would have been, but for the injury and minus their uh, new pension capacity. It's important to consider um, various aspects, including lump sum payments, uh, whether the pension's a money purchase scheme or a defined benefit scheme, um, and whether you perhaps need some expert evidence. It's also important to remember that loss of pension can be subsumed into lump sum awards. So if you're in a situation where you think you might have a lump sum award, don't forget to include the loss of pension in that, um, and that can always help boost that award. Turning on then to care and assistance damages, um, you'll often for past losses and past care and assistance see this being provided gratuitously. So from friends and family uh, without payment, unless you have a case where liability is admitted and you're receiving interim payments. Uh, it's important to consider the most appropriate rate and the standard of care provided. And you'll see the case from last year of CCC and Sheffield Teaching Hospitals uh, a really interesting case where the judge found uh, that there was no discount for gratuitous care, um, even when it had been pleaded on the aggregate rate due to the high standard of care that had been provided by the claimant's mother. So it's worth um, considering whether um, you need to give up that 25%, although often in most cases um, you will need to, compared to the standard commercial care rates. Uh, also, importantly, for stress at work claims, it doesn't just have to involve physical care, it can include psychiatric support, um, so prompting those with memory difficulties, help with digesting information, um, and emotional support and reassurance um, with regulating someone's emotional state. Um, just remember that it needs to go above and beyond what one would expect in normal life and needs to be as a result of, of those injuries, of course. Um, for future care, it's just important to think about who will be providing it moving forwards. The fact that someone's had a family member providing the care up till trial doesn't mean that they have to continue to rely on that family member to do that, of course. Um, and the case of CCC on the last slide is another good example uh, where the defendants failed to argue that 
where the claimant's mother wanted to go back um, to being a mother rather than being a carer. Um, beware, especially for care for psychiatric injuries, of the impact of assistive technology, where someone's providing care, for example, to help with memory difficulties, it's often considerably cheaper for a defendant to argue that uh, a device like an Alexa or a Google Home could be installed instead of having someone to do that care. Um, but of course, on the flip side, those things can be incredibly useful for claimants um, and the introduction of assistive technologies and, and um, subscriptions for what are some amazing apps out there can really help change someone's life and increase their independence. I put a very brief slide up about decorating DIY gardening is technically a separate head of loss to care and assistance, but something to bear in mind, including for psychiatric injuries where individuals no longer feel able to do these things. Two very quick points about that. Um, beware of carers and the issue of double recovery coming up um, if you've got a care claim and a claim for um, household uh, chores moving forward, the defendants may well look to argue that those should be disallowed. And there's a couple of cases up there, one where the defendants were successful in that argument and one where they were not. And also it's important to remember that where you have a claimant who has struggled before trial with domestic tasks, but has not paid anyone else uh, to carry them out and has not had any help from friends and family, although you won't be able to claim for that uh, as a head of special damages, it can be included in the award of PSLA. And that's really going back to what I said earlier about considering all aspects of someone's life and how it's been impacted when you're looking at your PSLA award. And the case of Daly that's on the screen um, is a good example of when the PSLA was um, boosted by the same amount that would have been provided for if the claimant had paid someone to do that work up, up till the date of trial. So it can make a real difference to a PSLA award. And then last but not least, in terms of medical treatment as a separate um, head of loss for special damages, um, is often pleaded for psychological and psychiatric therapies, especially as the provision of NHS treatment in those areas uh, seems to be getting slower and considerably more difficult to obtain. Um, the very basic point, I suppose, is don't forget that you can, you can plead them on a private rate uh, and Perhaps more importantly, that it's not just limited to, for example, uh, CBT and the like, but you can also consider more holistic therapies. One that I've considered for this talk is alternative therapies, as it may well be irrelevant to stress at work claims to assist with coping mechanisms, for example, especially when people are seeking to return back to work. Uh, remember um, that alternative therapies need to be akin to medical expenses for the courts to accept them. Um, and likely supported by some kind of medical or scientific literature to support their use. And there's a couple of useful cases up there um, in Jones where some of the alternative therapies were allowed by the court uh, and in uh, Witten where Justice Swift uh, didn't allow any of them and, and the reasons why. So if you're looking at a case where there may be useful alternative therapies, it's worth having a look at those um, cases. And lastly, on medical treatment, hopefully everyone's well aware of the Law Reform Personal Injury Act and its provisions about the disregarding um, of availability of treatments under the NHS. Um, I've also put up a very useful case um, of Eagle and Chambers that looked at this. And you can see that the court there found that it cannot be enough for the defendants to say that there is no evidence that the services will not be available from the NHS. Um, it's really important that when you're considering um, making claims for private medical treatment, the claimant has to show that they're likely to pay for the treatment. That's often done through um, very simple witness evidence to say that they would go for that treatment. As I say, it's slightly easier in psychiatric cases because um, of the limited availability of those on the NHS. And once the claimant's done that, is there no answer for a defendant to say that, well, that it is freely available? And if a defendant wishes to argue that a claimant will obtain therapies free from the state, then the burden lies on the defendant to prove that. And that was made very clear in the case of Eagle and you can see the citation on the slides. Uh, and that is everything for me and I will hand over to Chris. Went the wrong way for a while then. Um, 
As Rachel said, I, I'm uh, Chris Johnson, um, and uh, I'm a member of various teams in chambers, but about half of my work is uh, personal injury work. So that's the context in which I see uh, stress at work type claims is in uh, claims in the county court or claims in the high court for psychiatric injury sustained due to work. Um, a case that always stands out in my memory um, from relatively early on in my practice is I was instructed on behalf of a prison officer who had a extensive history of psychiatric illness and the prison were aware of that. Um, the, the officer witnessed a uh, a nasty assault by one convicted killer um, against another. And he, he was so affected by that that he had to take time off work to recover. Um, he went back to work and, and on his return, he was told immediately to personally supervise the perpetrator of the attack. Um, and uh, he left work and he never went back. Uh, another example, um, the case that takes up most of my working time at the moment is uh, the Grenfell Tower litigation. Uh, I, I represent 33 police officers who sustained psychiatric injury due to their involvement in the fire. And these are claims that have been in the spotlight recently, that they were the subject of a front page story in the Sunday Times on the 10th of March uh, this year. And the headline was, um, Grenfell Police saw over trauma of fire and what came next. That's kicked up um, quite some debate about the circumstances in which a person exposed to trauma at work should be able to recover. And there was a letter to the editor in this Sunday's edition, and it started, uh, police must be able to hand a tra handle trauma like Grenfell. Um, fortunately, this isn't the law, but this is, uh, this is the sort of debate that's relevant to all of us who act in uh, stress at work claims. Uh, I have 10 or 15 minutes and I've thought about how best to use it and settled on addressing a collection of uh, disparate issues that have arisen for me or arisen for me in recent cases uh, and that I hope might be of some wider interest. I've divided those into three topics. The first topic is the effect of high inflation. Uh, the second is the circumstances in which loss of congenial employment is recoverable, bu building on what Rachel said um, about quantum of loss of, loss of congenial employment awards. Uh, and then the final one, very briefly, is modelling, this idea of modelling a lost career. Um, starting with uh, the effect of high inflation. The, the numbers are fairly stark. Um, in the period since September 2021, cumulative RPI inflation has been 23.4%. How, how do we take this into account as litigators? Um, I think that there are four areas where we can do that. The first is um, when we're thinking about the amount of general damages that might be awarded. The next is when we're considering damages for future loss of earnings. Uh, the next one, uh, perhaps most obviously, is uh, interest. And then the final one is how it affects Part 36 offers. Um, and that builds on the, the, the three that go before it. If I start with uh, general damages, uh, how, um, how we can take inflation into account when we're thinking about general damages. Uh, as as Rachel has um, foreshadowed, when I when I sat down to write my notes for this talk, I had in front of me the bright pink 16th edition of the JC guidelines that was published in April 22. Uh, fast forward to today, and I've sat down to update my notes, and these have been superseded by the much duller purple 17th edition. Um, and in the introduction to that new edition, um, it clarifies how inflation should be taken into account. And there's a subheading in the introduction. Uh, it says, note on inflation. The, the reason I suspect that this note on inflation has been included in the new edition of the um, guidelines um, is a county court decision that was widely circulated last summer called um, Blair and Chabert. Um, and I'll send out um, 
I send a follow up email to, to this um, this presentation uh, with with links to any of the cases that I, I talk about. But this is a county court decision called Blair and Jabair, and it was really all over the place on on LinkedIn and um, on uh, Gordon Maxwell's blog. Um, and in that case, counsel for the claimant had um, sought to increase the judicial college guideline brackets for inflation, and counsel for the defendant had said that that wasn't right. The judge had the judge held that this is the quote: um, "The judicial college guidelines are just that guidelines. If there's a change in circumstances between April 2022 and today, that is a matter to take into account when assessing damages. The very substantial drop in the value of money which has taken place since April 2022 is just such a circumstance. Accordingly, the judicial college figures need to be increased by, in my judgment, about 12 percent." This judgment is almost right. Um, it's right to say that the brackets have to be updated for inflation, but it was wrong to say that that should be from April 2022. It should have been from September 2021, um, which was the last point up to which the guidelines had been updated. Uh, th this correct approach is now explicit in the 17th edition uh, in uh, the introduction under the heading note on inflation and, and uh, forgive me for reading it, but it says that there's unfortunately but unavoidably quite a long gap between the editorial team finalizing its work and the guidelines appearing in print. For example, as explained in the introduction to the 16th edition, the editorial team based the figures in that edition on RPIs that stood in September 2021, but the guidelines were not actually published until April 2022. Thus, even at the date of publication, the figures for every edition of the guidelines are already somewhat out of date. In times of higher inflation, and particularly when dealing with larger awards, the difference can be significant. To our surprise, the issue of whether to apply an inflationary increase uh, between editions still seems to attract some controversy, when in accordance with con conventional practice and procedure, it should not. We've noted that in some cases, judges have applied inflation only from the date of publication of the guidelines. So that's, a, it seems to me, a, a reference to this case, Blair um, and Jabert. Uh, it goes on to say, for the reason explained above, this is incorrect. The avoidance of doubt and inflationary increase to the guideline figures should be applied to ensure that figures remain up to date. Um, it's rather a long way of saying that this single takeaway point, which is to update the judicial college guideline figures for RPI inflation in the period um, after they were last updated. The, the, um, the, the second area where we might take inflation into account is when we're thinking about damages for future loss of earnings. Uh, Rachel's already explained that the idea uh, which we'll all be familiar with of this mathematical multiplier multiplicand calculation of future loss. Um, and that calculation um, doesn't, it appear, uh, leave a great deal of room for practitioners to try and take account of inflation. Um, thinking about the multiplier first, the multiplier is intended to address two factors that might lead to over, uh, overcompensation or undercompensation. So the first factor is that the claimant will have the opportunity to invest the settlement. Um, and that's a factor that would tend to lead to overcompensation. You get the sum in, in uh, early, you can invest it, um, and you, you get the uh, proceeds of that investment. Um, the, the second factor is that the value of the settlement sum will be diminished by inflation. Uh, and this is a factor that tends to lead to undercompensation. And the balance between these factors um, is what leads to either the um, overcompensation or the undercompensation. And that, I suppose, depends on um, the, the, uh, the, the financial conditions that prevail. Um, is there any room to take high inflation into account? Um, the, the, the answer is no. Um, the uh, Court of Appeal has made clear that inflation, uncertain inflation, is built into the multiplier. Um, the, the quote from uh, Lord Diplock is, um, the likelihood of continuing inflation after the date of trial should not affect either the figure of the dependency or the multiplier used. Inflation is taken care of in a rough and ready way by the higher rates of interest available as one of the consequences of it. 
So the calculation of the multiplier doesn't leave us any wiggle room for um, taking inflation into account. What about the calculation of the multiplicand? Uh, again, there's not a lot of uh, room for manoeuvre. Uh, there's a case called Cook and United Bristol Healthcare in the Court of Appeal in 2003. And in that case, the claimant tried to use staged multiplicands. Um, and th those were calculated to take account of predicted future inflation so that the, the, um, the, there was a new multiplicand introduced for a period of time into the future. And that was um, that, that was calculated taking into account uh, predicted inflation. Um, and that approach was rejected by the Court of Appeal, who said, um, once it's accepted that the discount rate is intended in any given personal injury case to be the only factor um, to allow for any future inflation relevant to the case, then the multiplicand cannot be taken as allowing for the same thing. So that approach using staged multiplicands to try and take account of un un inflation uh, is not allowed either. Um, so th there's not a great deal of room for manoeuvre. Um, what can you do? You can update your multiplicands to take account of any known or probable inflationary inf effects. Um, so you, you need to be thinking about whether there will be, uh, for example, any forthcoming collectively negotiated pay increases. Um, if someone's in a union, unionized role, contact the union, um, look for publicly available information, um, or look for any uh, mandatory contractual index linked pay increases. Uh, look for that in the in the in the contract. Um, aside from um, interrogating to what extent that the that there are known inflationary increases, uh, that there is unfortunately not a lot of room for manoeuvre. Um, the, the the next point where you might want to think about inflation is is interest. Um, Here, interest on special damages um, is conventionally awarded at half the special account rate um, on the total amount of past loss over the period from the date of injury to the date of trial. Um, and for the whole of my time at the bar, the special account rate had been 0.5%. Uh, and I, I never had to think about changing it in my schedules of loss. Um, that then on the 30th of June of 2022, it's increased to 0.645%. And it's since increased on a further eight occasions and is now 6%. Um, make sure you know the details of the changes um, and when they happened so that you can accurately uh, calculate interest. The, the, the final point about inflation is part 36 offers. And th this is really, um, it's an encourage, it's, it's encouragement to think about the cumulative effects of the points that I've already raised, um, which is that inflation will increase claimant awards, um, and in some ways it will do so significantly. For, for example, if you have a claim for general damages that in March 22 was worth 20,000, then just applying inflation, it would now be worth 23,500. And the amount of any inflationary increase will be higher in older claims and in claims of higher value. This increase in the value of a claim means that both claimant lawyers and defendant lawyers have to keep their Part 36 offers under review. That's because for claimants, um, historic Part 36 offers might have become inappropriate they might need to be withdrawn. Um, and for defendants, you have to be aware of both your own offers becoming toothless because the, the, the likelihood of, um, of the claimant failing to beat them will diminish, but also be aware of claimant offers, um, on the other hand, becoming an increasing threat um, because the, the claimant may, might have made those at a point when you weren't worried about them. Uh, and the, inflate, uh, the effect of the inflationary increase m might mean that you should be worried. 
that's um, that's inflation um, and the effects of inflation. I had two other topics, and they're they're, they're somewhat shorter. Um, the first is building on what Rachel has said about uh, awards for loss of congenial employment, and Rachel has focused on um, the amount of a, a award for loss of complete congenial employment. Um, but the, the point I want to make really is that loss of congenial employment is a head of loss that people sometimes overlook. It, it most obviously applies where someone has had to give up a job that they enjoy for a job that they don't enjoy. And as Rachel said, it, it, it's most often seen in professional occupations um, and in also service op occupations, things like um, the police, uh, the fire service and the uh, armed forces. But the, the, there are authorities that indicate that the principle extends further. Um, so there's a case called Jones and Pandis from 1993, which says that it applies where a claimant has had to give up work that they enjoy, even where they also enjoy their new work. Um, and there's another case from 1993 called Cornville and Tursoil. Um, and that case says that it applies where a claimant is preventing from pursuing a career uh, for which they've been studying or training, so that they've not even entered into the career which they say they would have um, enjoyed. Uh, I, I think that in principle, um, it, it goes even further than, than these two examples. I think in principle, uh, it should apply to any case where the claimant has lost a significant non-pecuniary benefit through a forced change in their career path. So, for, for example, uh, a claimant who's lost the opportunity to attain a desired promotion, that's a lost non-pecuniary benefit. That There'll be special damages as well, um, but also um, th there's the non-pecuniary side of that. Uh, a second example is a claimant who has lost a job that was convenient, um, perhaps a job that was close to home, uh, perhaps a job that had flexible working um, or one that was suitable to their disability. So these are all non-pecuniary losses from a forced change of career. And, and that, that's um, the, what I think the overriding principle is. The, the broad point, before I go on to my last topic, is that this head of loss um, da damages for loss of congenial employment is appropriate in far more claims than the claims where it's pleaded. My my final um, and and quite short uh, topic is this idea of modelling a lost career, and and I added this into my note just because I'd seen um, recently this done very well. Um, so w when a person has person's work has changed as a result of their injury, then they will need to adduce evidence of what they would have done if they hadn't have been injured. Their lost, their lost career, their lost career path. Um, and I, I've seen this evidenced very well um, through detailed witness statements from the claimant. Uh, what should they include? Uh, it should include educational history, uh, work history, the reasons behind key educational decisions and the reasons behind key work decisions. It should include the job moves that they intended to seek, the promotions that they intended to seek. It should explain all of this, why they intended to seek those job moves or why they intended to seek um, those promotions. When did they intend to seek those job moves and when did they intend to seek those promotions? Um, whether it's likely they would have got them, the requirements of those job moves and promotions, how the claimant would have met those requirements what the process was for seeking um, those moves or promotions, the experience of other people in, in comparable position to the claimant in getting that. So if the claimant has a colleague who's gone on to achieve what the claimant had hoped to, then maybe a statement from them as well. Um, it should include any available data on the uh, statistical probability of a job move or the statistical probability of a promotion. And I've seen that in claims for military personnel where there's um, well available data on um, uh, promotion to different ranks. Um, 
it should also deal with the strengths or weaknesses of uh, other applicants or other potential applicants so that you can show how relatively well qualified your uh, claimant was. Um, and, and witness statements and support from any um, family, um, mentors, colleagues. Uh, as I say, I mention this because I've seen it done very well recently. Um, th those are the um, those are the three topics that I, I'd I'd want to consider. I hope that that was some help, um, if a bit uh, eclectic. But um, let me pass to uh, Moktiar. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll try and start my PowerPoint. Please bear with me. Excellent. Um, thank you uh, both. Um, I'm going to be looking at things more from an employment tribunal practice. That's more my uh, area. Most of my practice is uh, whistleblowing and uh, various types of discrimination claims, predominantly uh, for claimants, but a growing response of practice too, uh, particularly in the uh, regulated sectors. <clears throat> Um, I'm mindful of time. It's five to seven. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and yeah, get through this in about 15, 20, 20 minutes. Um, IT providing. Um, so I'm going to be looking at strategy, some principles to apply, and how to gross up large awards, uh, something that us employment law lawyers try our best to avoid. Um, but I'm going to go through uh, how this can be done relatively easily. So we've done remedy as the third uh, further the series, but I'm, I'm a great fan of thinking remedy at the start of litigation, even before litigation. And um, think, what does the client want? What is realistically available? And then have a, an early view uh, on, the, on the value of the claim so you can formulate the litigation strategy. Um, obviously, in the tribunal, it's very rare to get your cost back. Um, so think about how is the client going to fund this? If you're thinking about a CFA or a DBA, uh, and I think it can be tempting when a claim presents, a client presents uh, what might be a high value claim. And um, avoid, I think, trying to get too drawn into the figures. Reality check what's being said. Reality check the merits of the case. Also think about whether you've got sufficient professional indemnity cover for the value of the claim. Um, that includes, I think, tips for, for barristers as well. Given the high risks involved, think about what if you get something wrong? So what internal mechanisms have you got in place? It might be in a larger firm, you can get other fee, fee earners involved to, to cross-check, or you can get counsel involved. Uh, think evidence. Um, I found it fascinating what Chris was saying about mapping out, modelling career loss. In my experience, we, we often overlook in the tribunal um, approaching remedy evidentially. I think it's something often overlooked. Um, even when disclosure is ordered, most judges, I think, will say disclosure includes in relation to remedy. Um, but often uh, claimants don't disclose documents in relation to remedy. It's an ongoing duty. You can put things in later. Um, witness evidence should include the effects of the unlawful acts, um, unless you have a separate uh, hearing ordered uh, that's going to uh, cover remedy. You should uh, produce your witness evidence and in the narrative say what each unlawful act um, had, what, what effect it had on the client. Um, be careful not to um, overcook it though. 
um, and this is this is something that um, is uh, does happen. It's hard to manage. I think what's needed is uh, very strong client handling skills as well as sensitive uh, client handling skills. Just remember, I mean, in my in my view, when presenting those types of claims at the final hearing, it can be very hard to present them um, in a in a, in a way that does it justice when it's clearly a scattergun approach. From re, from a respondent's perspective, uh, they'll be looking to exploit this. So, uh, in the way you're presenting the claim, the pleadings might start the claim. The claimant was employed for the respondent for six weeks and claims three million pounds for failing to make reasonable adjustments. Straight away, it gives the impression to the uh, judge reading it that this might be an over-exaggerated claim. Remember causation, it can be then very difficult to pin down your injury to feelings, personal injury, to a particular unlawful act when let's face it, you're likely to lose on a number of those acts. From an employer perspective, when presenting those types of cases, uh, you'd look to drill down onto those weaker claims, spend more time in cross-examination on those weaker claims. Emphasise that those were the issues that concerned you the most. So when claimants say things in evidence, this was a low point, this triggered X, Y, Z, that's, bear in mind, that's something that an employer will, be, will exploit. Um, I've laid down here the principles in relation to multiple causes. Um, I'm just going to leave that on the screen for, for a, a short time and just simply uh, say this. What the approach the tribunal is saying, the, the approach the tribunal takes is not to try and divide up the causative contribution, i.e. you won on half your claims, therefore you get half your damages. But what the tribunal does is look at the harm that was caused. And if that harm can then be divided, that's the approach that the tribunal will take. Just some general points and approach, some uh, cases that you could perhaps have in your armory and have in mind. Um, I think that uh, Adiola was going to talk about bentos and schedule of losses. Uh, and um, I'm grateful that Chris has talked about inflation. It's, it's a very important thing. It's something that uh, we need to be careful about. Because often with in the tribunal, we think of vento bans and we instinctively think a claim is worth within a particular range. Um, it's surprising how much they've jumped in the last couple of years. Um, so particularly at the stage where you're valuing a claim, uh, look, at look at the comparative cases. I tend to look at those comparative cases more so for valuing a claim as opposed to remedy stage used in our RPI calculator. Um, but I, what I tend to do is I cross refer to the Ventos bands at the time and say, for example, uh, in 2011 on this, on these facts, an award was made in the middle of the middle of, of the middle band and the middle band at the time was this amount. Uh, remember that when compensation is ordered, is ordered, it is to be assessed in the same way as damages for a statutory tool. So just and equitable uh, is for uh, the choice of remedy, not the amount of, of compensation. And that's something just to be uh, worth. So these principles I've put on this slide are principles that are worth reminding the tribunal of. They, there's no at the end, let's just apply a bit of just and equitable. Uh, oh, particularly from a respondent perspective, look out for double recovery. I think it's very common when you look at a schedule of loss that you can find some 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 double recovery. The most common one 
is is a notice pay claim on top of future loss, but there there can be others. And um, this great case, I think, if you're claiming um, Lindsay and Cooper contracting, uh, use the principles, nine principles set out in that case. Remember, it's for the respondent to prove that the claimant has not mitigated. Uh, and the respondent will be expected to produce evidence to support that the claimant had acted unreasonably. And it's one of the principles, I think it's principle seven, says the tribunal should not apply too demanding a standard on the victim. After all, they are the victims of a wrong. That's important to remind the tribunal remedy stage. The claimants are not to be put on trial as if the losses were their fault when the central cause is the act of the wrongdoer. So in relation to mitigation, I would suggest that both the claimant and the respondent are looking for evidence from the outset and the log is kept together with documents. If you use a spreadsheet normally now, uh, tribunals don't mind having things in, in spreadsheet format which logs all your attempts, for example, at finding employment. And it's more persuasive than for an employment to, employer to say, okay, we don't take issue on attempts to find employment. Um, on, on ACAS uplift, so ACAS can be up to 25%. So when you're talking about big money awards, this is a significant potential uplift or uh, in decrease. It's a growing area of, of law. I don't think the authorities are, are that clear as to uh, which types of claims uh, it can be said that the ACAS Code of Practice on Grievance and Discipline applies. I've referred to two competing authorities. Um, I, I would favour uh, the latter approach, indeed, would say the latter approach, the wider approach, is uh, doesn't go far enough. Uh, and that's because the statute says when these codes don't apply, for example, redundancy, and it's not listed, it should go into play, uh, particularly when some sort of review of performance and relationships is an issue. Um, for employers, just remember deductions. If someone's not put in the grievance, go for that deduction. 25% can be significant. Um, I appreciate that some client claimants will not want to appeal or not wish to put a grievance. They think there's no point. I'm either not well enough to do it or no one's going to investigate it. My view in those kinds of scenarios is that you should look to uh, put in a written grievance and if you can't engage with the process, uh, with client can, with your help, uh, deal with the grievance process on the papers, not attend hearings and do it as a Q&A. And in that way, you protect yourself and potentially get yourself into uplift category as opposed to deductions. When you are looking um, at uh, large claims there is a much more structured approach when it comes to ACAS. There's three authorities I refer to there, they all apply slightly different tests um, and that applies for all value claims but this structure tends to buy more when you're looking at the high value claims and Plasto is a good case uh, to refer to because it, it applies in a, a structured approach and then at the end it it, 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 it says that the, the tribunal uh, should just have a final sense check, uh, looking at the principle of totality. So in that claim, case was a prison officer claim, claim, and I think it was around about the million pound mark. Um, that before the uplift, there should have been a, a step back and look at this is some amount, this is the sum that we're awarding is when we think just and equitable, we need to look into the totality of the award made thus far.
uh, turning now to tax. Um, now, this is uh, something which is uh, quite peculiar to the tribunal. It doesn't apply in the county court cases. The principle of, of Gawley is that the amount you get awarded should be the amount that goes in your pocket in, in a nutshell. And, and as practitioners, we come across it in, in two main areas. One, when we're looking at um, notice period. So when there's a pile on, for example, a payment in lieu of notice made, that would not be taxable. Uh, the tricky bit with the higher value cases is uh, the payments that are made at over £30,000 relating to dismissal. And it's section 401 we look at, and it says that we are looking at payments received directly or indirectly in consideration or in consequence of or otherwise in connection with termination. Uh, we know now, and we had many arguments as to whether injury to feelings was taxable or not. Um, in, in a nutshell, it is. Uh, if it falls within the £30,000 exception, fine, but it, it is taxable. I recognise psychiatry injury, i.e. personal injury, isn't. <clears throat> um, I, I recently had a claim where we were successful in uh, an unfair dismissal claim, um, but also uh, uh, under the Equality Act in relation to a grievance about the dismissal. Uh, the respondent, so in these types of scenarios, if you won, you want to argue that everything's taxable and get it grossed up. And from the respondent's perspective, you're looking to argue it the other way. The respondent argued that the relevant award was not connected uh, to for the relevant award in relation to the complaint, the grievance was not connected to the claimant being dismissed. And so there's no link to the dis dismissal award. I found that somewhat surprising because we are appealing or making agreements about the dismissal. And so I, I we, we denied it. Um, and the tribunal uh, found in the respondent's favor. And it was uh, this case, which I'd never come across be before, that the respondents council relied upon them effectively you could you can look at that in your, in your own time but the the upper uh, upper tribunal uh, first day tribunal in relation to tax said that there's no link between the payment and the termination um, now if you get this wrong uh if tribunals are not sure so if it later transpires, it is taxable. What you need to do is you contact the tribunal and you make an application for reconsideration. And if you make an application for reconsideration on the basis that the tribunal got the tax wrong, and it might be that the, the both parties presented it in that way, but, uh, but there's subsequently learned that tax mission is wrong, it can be reopened and then the uh, decision should be changed. If it doesn't, then you go to the EAT. So don't panic too much if you get that wrong. Um, but do panic when you're grossing up. Uh, now, uh, last year, uh, I uh, won, a, uh, won, won, won an age discrimination case close to retirement. So we were talking quite big, big money, difficulty getting back into the workplace. Tribunal goes straight to remedy hearing. Uh, we get awarded uh, over £200,000 and says to, to me, um, but also my opponent, uh, work out the tax, come back in 30 minutes. Um, luckily, I had um, a solicitor checking the maths for me and uh, who had a paralegal looking up personal allowances, etc. You know, at that time, your opponent is uh, licking their wounds, so not really going to be actively helping you. Um, so you're, you're pretty much on, on your own. Um, there's a better way, though. And the better way is to use what's called a Finley table. 
um, and if named after the case uh, Finley and Finley in the EAT. Uh, in the in Harvey, there's a there's a, a picture of it. That's it there, um, and it's very scary. And I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes to you uh, telling you why it shouldn't be shouldn't be scary. But you'll see, basically, there's two halves to this: the other income, and then the tribunal award. So just bear with me. I'm going to try and get my spreadsheet up. So um, you have this spreadsheet. So um, it looks pretty scary. Um, if we look at column A, we, we apply the personal allowances. We have this um, strange new rate. Um, and I confess this is something that has, um, I've overlooked uh, before. And, not, and I uh, confess to that. Not sure if, uh, how many uh, practitioners are, are aware of how to use it. But it's taking effect, tapering. Uh, and tapering is such that the higher rate of tax um so so for every two pound of income that falls in that, that band your personal allowance gets re reduced by a pound so for every two pound a pound comes into the higher rate band it sounds very confusing um but what you're effectively saying is that uh your uh within that band your adding 50% to the 40% to get 60%. Okay, so trust me, that's right. So you, that, now that's right. So you've got your award, and uh, I've typed here my award, let's say it's 300,000 pounds. Here you put in your tax exemption. If you've used some of it, you put a smaller amount. So you're looking at 270,000. And what you're doing is, um, you are applying, you are making sure that you're getting every penny of this. So you're bringing it down to zero. Here at the end, you get zero. So you're using each line, using your, your, your first allowance. You get your net amount that comes off the top. You then get your next allowance, calculate the net amount that comes off and so on. Uh, it seems really complicated. But once you understand how this works, and when you're, if you understand that when you're going to get into the additional rate, you're going to get your balance amount and put it here as your net, and then do your sum backwards. So you're going to divide by 0.55 to get this. So you're going to gross up that way. And then you've got your gross, uh, you've got your gross figures here. You've got your subtotal and you add back, well, this will automatically add back your 30,000 allowance. So if the tribunal awards 300,000 uh, pounds, you get the award is 495,000. So it's, it's a significant additional uh, and important calculation that needs to be done. And once you understand that, you just add in other income. Again, that looks scary. This is the Findlay table. And I've highlighted the amount that your client has had in terms of other income. And you, you effectively apply it that first, and then that affects your balance. So you, you, you use it in your personal allowance, hasn't affected it. Go into your next band, you've then got another 12,000 to play with go to your tax tribunal award, this automatically takes off 12,000 from that band, and then the rest just goes into place just like the rest of it. Um, so that in this case, an award of 250,000 pounds would have amounted to 420,000 pounds. So um, I've, I've had to hurry through that, but you've got the slide that has the Findlay table 
if it doesn't make sense how to do the table, do get in touch. Because once you once you understand how to do this, you can apply it to smaller amounts. But predominantly, this is there for, for sums that are going to get you into the additional rate. Um, thankfully, in a way, of, of course, we don't want to pay more tax, but just think of the positive, and that is this table applies in the next tax year. And so fiscal drag is good if you don't want to do a, a new table every uh, financial year. So um, that's it. Um, I'm, there's some questions in the in the box. Um, someone's asked if I could circulate the uh, spreadsheet. Um, I would ask you to email me individually if you if you want to ask that. I'm not going to circulate widely. It took me uh, a long time to get my head around, and um, I would be nervous around giving it to someone who doesn't hasn't fully understood actually how it works because you could actually get it wrong you've got to understand how um, the formulas work first um, another question is does an ACAS uplift apply to a capability dismissal uh, when employers unreasonably skip to sickness no. so I, I it, it, it doesn't because it's not on the face of it it doesn't um, it, it doesn't because um, it doesn't fall into the grievance uh, and it doesn't fall uh, within discipline. But if it's starting factually to look like discipline, then I think there is scope to argue. But you're arguing against EAT authority. But I, I think that there's un, it's an unsettled area and we, you, we should be pushing for that latter more purposive interpretation uh, and so i would say on the face of it no it doesn't but if you want to get to the at and have a fight over it uh, arguably it does but the more it looks like discipline then i think it'd be more persuasive in the inner of it are there any more questions i'm probably bored everyone to death talking about tax you just answered everyone's questions once yeah <laughs> Perfect. Shall we call it a day there then? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, thank you everyone for um, coming. Um, I hope it's been useful and uh, we'll circulate, uh, I think, a link to the recording. Um, and then I, I also have, um, uh, I, I have my list of authorities that I refer to and I know that the others have their slides. So all of that will come round. Um, thank you everyone for uh, joining.